Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Steve Rose, I'm the Managing Director and Deputy Chief Executive of Wakefield and District Housing. Um, I'm going to lower the tone by talking about welfare reform in the room. I was told everybody that we've been done a lot of talks at WDH over the last year since we've been part of the pilots and been told by everybody that when we finish talking, people want to throw themselves out the windows and commit suicide when we finish. So I'm going to try and make a positive spin on what we're talking about today. For anybody who doesn't know, that's where Wakefield is, in the middle, middle, of, the, middle of the country. Um, we are obviously, standing here today, we are the second most attractive part of Yorkshire. In that, obviously, the most attractive is Richmond, because that's where I live. Um, we've had some problems in the Wakefield district over the year. I'll apologise to anybody who's under the age of 30 in, in the room. That's a coal mine. You've probably never seen one, but that's what one used to look like. Um, we were a heavy industry, we went through, it was something Elaine touched upon when she talked about confident communities. We were stock transfer, we came into, into existence in 2005 with the express mission to create confident communities. The mining communities that were, that were the ex-mining communities were incredibly confident communities. And the thing that Elaine talked about, taking the working out of working class, destroyed that confidence in those areas. And that's what we've been working on for eight years to try and achieve. And there's been a rebirth in Wakefield. We are coming back, we are bouncing back. And that's the Hepworth Gallery that was launched a couple of years ago, now in the top 10 cultural visitor attractions in the country. We've got the Yorkshire Sculpture Museum, we've got the largest indoor ski slope, and we've got the biggest collection of the biggest sheds in the world in, in Wakefield. What that means is our biggest industry is now the distribution industry. We've replaced careers, we've replaced well-paid, skilled jobs with people in distribution sheds, which is low-paid, temporary, zero-hour contract, part-time, which has changed the nature of our area. But the one thing we've got, and we will always have, is rhubarb. We are the world capital for the production of rhubarb. We produce more rhubarb per head of population than anywhere else in the world. Um, it used to be a major part of our economy, but since the economic downturn, it's now started to crumble. <laughs> and it was worth coming, wasn't it? It was worth coming just for that joke. I'm going to start with an apology. Uh, and the apology is, please don't pay any attention to the slides that are up there and listen to the words. Um, we are part of the direct payment demonstration pilot. And please tell me there's nobody in the DWP actually in the audience as I start to speak. Um, please ignore everything I say from now on, and please and don't report back. Um, every presentation we do which talks about welfare reform has to go through the DWP thought police before we're allowed to uh, send it out. So what we tend to do is send out extremely bland presentations and then talk about what's really happened. Um, I have also been told that the DWP sniper is in the building, so if you see a red dot appear here, you know I've gone slightly over, stepped over the line. Um, what I'm going to talk about is where we were at the start of the project. I am slipping through these slides because there's really nothing of interest in them whatsoever. Um, and where we are now, what we've found that works, what doesn't work, what the wider impacts of welfare reform have been, and then the big caveat at the end, which is answer the question, are we prepared for universal credit? And I'll give you the answer, or, or my view of it. I have to say, if I stray into anything political, that is purely my opinion, not the opinion of WDH or anybody else, it's my opinion. Um, so where we were at the start, and I think it's really um, important that, this is the bit you need to listen to, of anything I say, ignore the rest, this is the bit. When we started the demonstration project, there was one view a very strong government view of how direct payments was going to work and what it was about. So when we started on the direct payments, the view was everybody will be on direct payments. No exceptions, no excuse, everybody will direct payments. We sort of squealed when we were told that. We then got the line, oh, the minister is prepared to accept that there will be 10% of the most vulnerable people who are excluded. We have no idea who they'll be, what they'll be, how we define vulnerability, but it can't be more than 10%. Where we are now, after the year and a bit we've been working on this, it is generally accepted there will be 20 to 30% of people who will not be on direct payments, depending upon the area, depending on the, on the client base. 
and there's a lot of work being done about the guidance of who should be included, who shouldn't be included, that's out there. The one thing I have to stress, this is guidance. What we've found is, this is completely different to anything, any, I'm sure, in the nature of this audience, there's a lot of people who have spent lots of big chunks of their lives sat in rooms defining what vulnerability is and coming up with a definition of what vulnerability, whatever project and whatever funding we're at to that point. This is completely different. This is at people who are vulnerable and at risk of getting into debt and getting into trouble financial. And it's, you can't make the assumptions. Just because somebody is this, they can't manage their own finances. And one of the things we have found is that it really, you really have to know your people. You really have to know your tenants. You really have to understand and you have to have that dialogue to, to ensure that you aren't putting people onto this scheme who are going to get themselves into trouble. Um, the second thing we, when we've talked about it, does, every, does everybody have, do I have to explain switchback? Does anybody not know what, what the expression switchback means in the room? No. Right. Switchback means if somebody goes on to direct payment, so the money is being paid to them, as if they get into arrears, if they get into financial trouble, the payment then will switch back at some point to the landlord. And all the pilots have been demonstrating different weeks. Ours was eight weeks, if somebody got into eight weeks arrears, then it will switch back. And the discussion at the start of the pilot was, if somebody got to that level of arrears, that would then trigger a debate. with the tenant and the DWP around whether they should switch back or not switch back and what support we've got. It's now been accepted, it will be automatic. If they reach the trigger point on arrears, it will, the switch back will be automatic to the landlord. Um, I think the final version, it will be eight weeks, but after four weeks, the landlord will have a, the right to speak to the DWP to say, this person's in trouble, we really need to switch it back to, to the landlord on that basis. We also have another expression which is switch forward, which is if it's switched back to you and then you've worked with that person and got them into the position where they can manage their finances, you can then switch forward and switch the payment back to the tenant um, So on that basis. So it's all got a bit complex. Um, but we think we've got something that's worked. We set off with just over a thousand people on, on our direct payment pilot. We are currently running at 664. There's about 20 or 30 have moved in or off the pilot, moved around. There's over 200 where the payment has switched back to us on that basis. Of that 200, only a handful have been because they've hit eight weeks arrears. There is another, th another caveat in, which is if, listen to this very carefully, um, which is if the arrears get to 15% of the arrears over a 12-week debit from persistent underpayments, then you can switch back the payments on that basis. What we have found on the pilots is there are very, very, very few people who pay nothing. Lots of people pay something. And it is the persistent underpayment that leads to the switchback, not people paying nothing on that basis. What we found consistently, and this is across all six pilots, is most people pay everything to begin with. You get some who pay nothing, and they're going to pay you nothing, and they're going to switch back, and that's on that. And everything settles down on that basis. Most people pay something for the first couple of months, and then people think, what happens if I keep a bit back? <laughs> so if I underpay, but I've got £450 coming in, if I underpay by £50, what happens? And the experience of the pirate is, if nothing happens, then the next time, it'll be £100 to keep back. And if nothing happens, then the next time, it'll be £150 for the people who are going to underpay. Um, I'll talk a bit later about more detail about what we've done around debt to counter that, but that's been the experience. And the other way we've changed, so now there's going to be a switchback methodology. Um, it should mean that housing providers aren't disadvantaged and there should be a safety net in place to protect those people who are in trouble. Um, the other thing was about provision of information and data sharing between the DWP and the, uh, the pilot areas. Um, which was bizarre, some of the most bizarre conversations I have ever had in my career, which is the DWP's attitude at the beginning was there will, be, there sh will and should be no reason for a housing provider to have any knowledge of a, a, their tenant's housing benefit status. No, there, sh there will be no relationship between the housing <coughs> provider and 
the DWP. We're not going to tell you anything about their benefit. That's to do with us and the claimant, nothing to do with the housing provider. So we had some surreal conversations which went along the lines of, so when we get to the end of the year, we've set our rent increase for next year, who do we send the rent file through to? What rent file? Well, you know when we calculate what the rent increase and how much housing benefit you're going to pay the next, next year, and we send that through now to the local authorities' housing benefit, and they pay it based on that. Who do we send that rent file to? Oh, we don't want it. Well, how are you going to know how much housing benefit you're going to need to pay to the tenant next year? Oh, the tenants will tell us, and we'll pay them what they ask for. I did this presentation to a group of um, fraud investigation officers and auditors a few weeks ago, and they nearly fell off the seats at that point. I have to say, once again, we've moved a million miles away from that, where there is a real understanding of the role that housing providers play in people's lives and in the uh, administration of, of housing benefits. Um, moving on to the wider impacts, we have, or had, 5,274 of our tenants affected by the bedroom tax when it came in in April. We had 80 tenants who were affected by the benefit cap, and we had one person who was affected by the bedroom tax and the benefit cap at the same, which I thought would be impossible, but actually the circumstances manager. We are one of the hardest hit um, at local authority areas in terms of the bedroom tax, simply for the fact we have had a policy and Wakefield Council have had it for generations and we carried it on, which I think is a great policy, which is we do not put families into two, bed two and three bedroom flats and maisonettes. Um, we believe a family should have a garden, should have a gate, should have security on that basis. It means that all, or virtually all, of our two and three bedroom flats and maisonettes are by nature under-occupied because we house singles and couples in those, those properties. Um, so, and 50% of the people who are on the demonstration pilot are hit by um, the bedroom tax. There's, the analysis we've done shows there's absolutely no difference between the behaviour of those people who are on direct payments who are affected by the bedroom tax and the behaviour of those people on, on, who are not on the direct payments who are affected by the bedroom tax. It doesn't seem to make a blind bit of difference whether they're receiving direct payments or not in terms of that. Um, I was going to do a chunk, which I know I'm doing this presentation, about the support and help we do for tenants who are affected by welfare reform on that basis. But as that is the theme of my workshop, if you want to hear that bit of the speech, you need to come to the workshop to hear on that. So in terms of debt, um, I think this time last year, all housing providers were busy stuffing as much money as possible under the mattresses to make provision for the impact of debt on their business plans and going forward. Um, I'm going to talk now specifically about the impact on us as a landlord. If you want to talk about, hear about the impact on tenants, then that will be in the workshop session. Um, so we made big provisions for arrears going up. Um, April last year, we completely restructured the organisation from the top down. The reason I am the managing director and deputy chief executive is we cut our senior management team. We took exec directors from five to three. We took the senior management team from 15 to 10. We took nearly 90 people whose role was back office roles, sitting in offices, now as jobs are out on the estate meeting and talking to tenants. We completely restructured all the way through in preparation for this coming in. Um, we made huge provisions for debt in terms of the impact it would have. Um, I have to, I'm very pleased to say, I'm very proud to say, our debt as we speak today is lower than it was last year at this stage. Um, it's not had the impact we thought. Um, in terms of, but it's taken a huge amount of work and a huge amount. What we've found in terms of debt is three things that are matter. One is speed of reaction. Um, you have to react. The days of, we wait five days before we send the first letter out, we send, wait another seven days before we send the, the next letter out, have gone. If you're on the debt direct payment, you get contacted, you get a text to say the money is going to hit your bank account tomorrow. You get another text to say the money has hit, hit your bank account today. Um, we have developed our system so we have an expected payment date for each tenant in there because every tenant pays differently. If you miss that, your expected payment date, you get a text. If you don't get a response, you get a phone call. If you don't get, if you don't get a response from the phone call, you get a visit. We do more work for our debt team at evenings and weekends than we do at 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, and it works. 
The second is knowledge, issue is knowledge. Actually understanding the complexity of the lives of the people who live in our house. We've won awards over the years from the Audit Commission, from TPAS about the level of understanding and the information we capture and the, like, all the information we know about our tenants. The direct payment and welfare reform has taught us we absolutely knew absolutely nothing about how tenants actually live their lives and the complexity of their, of their financial arrangements and how they live. And that leads into the third, which is flexibility. People use direct payments to manage their accounts, manage their finances. We've got to a state with the 664 who were left on. If they have a problem, if they have an issue, they will get in touch. And we are flexible. So if somebody rings up and says, my car broke down today, I need to get it repaired, I need my car to get to work. If I don't get from there, if I don't get um, my car fixed, I can't work. I need, to, I need to underpay by £100 this month, but I owe pay £100 next month. We are flexible, we listen, we accommodate, and that's the relationship that we've developed. The one area that has taken us by surprise is welfare reform, which we've planned for a little bit, um, is the level of terminations of tenancies that we have experienced. Our terminations have gone up by 30%. Um, we have areas of the district where we have difficult to let properties, where we have never had difficult to let properties before. And that's the one area we I mean, our home search team who allocate our houses have worked magnificently. I mean, I can't say... So, no, terminations have gone up by 30% and the properties we've allocated has gone up by 28%. So we've had a 2% increase in our actual voids levels. Um, for our team, that's... The, they're devastated because their figures have gone up, but in terms of letting, letting properties has become far harder. And we are developing individual strategies with the pockets of stock now where we have to change what we allocate. So that's been the biggest impact really for us as a, as a business of welfare reform has been people. To, and a lot, of, a lot of that has been incredibly proactive. We have people coming to us saying, I know because of the bedroom tax, I cannot manage a tenancy, I cannot afford, I'm going back to live with my parents, I'm doing this. It's people taking a positive action. There is a, not massive numbers, but a big, a big chunk where we have had two tenants who are in, in a relationship, both have a tenancy, um, both on full housing benefit, both subject to the bedroom tax, who will give up one tenancy, move in together, and um, only be subject to bedroom tax once rather than twice. So it's got some big challenges as, as an organisation. Um, we've sort of struggled, not struggled, wrong word, accidentally developed over the last year uh, a consultancy arm that's been going around the country and providing advice in terms of debt and arrears. And as I say, accidental was the word. We had a couple of people came along who said, could we help them? They told other people, they said, can you help us? So what we found on debt is not just based on our experience, but has been across the board, really. And that is um, the IT systems that we all use, and it doesn't matter whether it's Capita, whether it's Northgate, whether it's Orchard, whoever you've got, aren't very good. It's a simple, but there's no other way to say it. The, IT, the housing IT industry is 20 years behind the others, and that's because they can get away with it, as, you know, as simple as that. We believe we've got our IT system working really well and the secret to our success has been automating as much of the process as we can. So it is automated, so we are own, and we prioritize the cases who need the, you know, uh, the point that was made at the human contact, which is expensive. Um, and it's worked, and it's worked for a lot of other organizations as well. But it is really about, as I said before, about the speed of response and the flexibility to actually make an impact and make it happen. And that's what we've worked on as an organisation. And we, well, not one of my greatest moments as a director, I brought some people in a few years ago in the organisation to talk about customer service. And they, took, they stood there and they talked about customer centricity, which as you can imagine in West Yorkshire went down really well when you had these consultants talk about customer centricity. Um, and we, had, we talked about what we were going to do about debt and one of my wags in the, the work we said, does that mean we're now debt-centric rather than customer-centric? And to some extent, we are. The whole organisation has been geared around getting the money in. You cannot contact us as an organisation. If, if it flags up on our 
see our own screen, but we need to talk to you about debt. You cannot get anything from us as an organisation until you have talked to us about your arrears. Simple as that. Yeah, we won't do anything, that's obviously, unless someone's got water pouring through the, the roof or something like that. But in terms of, we make sure that people have no option but to talk to us about their arrears on everything that, that we do. We found one of the biggest, most surprising things, and I think one of the most rewarding things is, <coughs> we've had an increase in arrears for some people on the demonstration pilot, but that has been offset by the number of people who have increased the credit balances on their accounts. People, because they've got more uncertainty, are putting a bit of money where they can aside to cover them for things that happen in the future, which has been one of the most rewarding things. And I said I would finish by answering the question, are we ready for universal credit? Well, from our perspective, um, there is one huge caveat on the work that we've done. The first is, we've developed a system on the, on the direct payment pilots where we think direct payments will work. I think it will work for tenants and it will work for the organisations who are administering it. The big problem is we have done that by taking out the reason that the government said they wanted to introduce direct payments. If they said direct payments was about those people who needed help and support in budgeting, in managing their finances as being the first step down the road to actually getting into employment. Well actually, the people who need that help, we're excluding from direct payments. We've only got the people on direct payments who can already manage their accounts, manage their budgets, and I am pretty sure if we gave the 664 people who are still now part the choice of, do you want the payments still to come into your bank account, or do you want to go to your landlord, 663 would probably say, please give it to my landlord because it just makes my life easier on that basis. The big caveat is it has worked for us because of our relationship with Wakefield Council's housing benefit department. We have a fantastic relationship with Wakefield Council and their housing benefit department. We work hand in glove and we made, we've made this pilot work for us. The one big question mark on all this is, we have not tested any of this with a centralised payment of housing benefit through the DWP. And unless somehow the centralised system can replicate that level of local knowledge, local understanding, I think there are big problems ahead. So my answer is, are we ready for universal credit? Well, we want to say we're ready for universal credit. The question is, are the DWP ready for it? Thank you very much.